Will Louis A. Marciano and Provost Tate please join me at the podium for the presentation of the second honorary degree. Thank you, President Sanchez. Upon recommendation of the Honorary Degree Committee, it gives me great pleasure to present an honorary degree of public service to Louis A. Marciano. Mr. Marciano has been a proud member and supporter of the Rhode Island College community for more than 60 years. The son of Italian immigrants, he was born in Providence in 1924 and attended Mount Pleasant High School. After serving his country in the Navy during World War II, he attended Arnold College in Connecticut, earning a bachelor's degree in science and physical education and becoming the first in his family to graduate from college. He earned a Master of Education in School Administration from Rick in 1960. Mr. Marciano's long career supporting the health and education of Providence students began back at Mount Pleasant High School, where he served as science department chair as well as coach to championship wrestling and football teams. He later ascended to director of health and physical education for the Providence Public School Department and chief of health promotion for the Rhode Island Department of Health. Mr. Marciano's service to Rhode Island College includes 49 years and counting on the board of directors of the Rhode Island College Foundation. He received the college's Man of the Year Award in 1995 and the Alumni Association Service Award in 2005. In November of 2021, he was selected by a delegation from the college to lay a wreath at the tomb of the own unknown soldier at Arlington National Cemetery. President Sanchez, Mr. Marciano exemplifies the coveted qualities represented by the honorary doctorate degree, and thus, it is my honor to present Louis A. Marciano for the Doctor of Public Service degree at Rhode Island College. Yeah, got it. Yep. By virtue of the authority vested in me and with the concurrent action of the faculty of Rhode Island College and the Rhode Island Board of Education, I hereby confer upon you, Louis A. Marciano, the degree Doctor of Public Service. Well, I was born in Providence on Academy Avenue near LaSalle Academy, and uh, I grew up there, went to Mount Pleasant High School, and uh, the war was declared during my time as a junior in high school, and uh, the day it was declared on December 8th, uh, many of the students in our school, the male students, turned their books in and, and joined the Army. Seven of them who I know did that. Mm -hmm. So I went home and told my father I wanted to join the Navy, and he said, no, you've got another year of school, so you're going to go, which I did. And then the following uh, uh, January, February, I was in the February class. Uh, in March, I was in the Navy, mm -hmm. and I went overseas, and I was a radio operator on a ship in the South Pacific. When I came back, I went to college in Connecticut. And uh, in 1950, I graduated from college, and I started my career as a teacher in Providence. I taught in elementary school my first few years. Then I taught at Alabahaza Perry Junior High School at the time. They're now middle schools. And then I was uh, drafted to go to Mount Pleasant High School to teach biology and anatomy and physiology because I had been coaching there for about seven or eight years up to that point as an itinerant coach. And I coached football, I was an assistant coach, football, and I was the head wrestling coach for 14 years. Well, I, uh, that was my only teaching experience mm -hmm. because 
uh, from Mount Pleasant High School as head of the science department, I became the district-wide supervisor for health, physical education, and athletics. Mm -hmm. And in that department, I also had seven part-time doctors. I think it was 15 dentists, uh, 18 nurses, and that was uh, a health division. Mm -hmm. And the part-time dentists would check the kids by law. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, children from grade one, uh, four and eight had to have their teeth checked. Mm -hmm. And if they found severe problems, they would send them to the Rhode Island Hospital where they had a very fine clinic. I don't know if it still exists. Samuel's Dental Clinic. Mm -hmm. yeah. We would send kids there by the hundreds. Mm -hmm. They did a great job. But from, uh, from teaching, uh, I ended up being chairman of the group for writing state projects mm -hmm. before President um, uh, Nixon went out of office, mm -hmm. a bill was passed creating funding for states who had health programs mm -hmm. where they were beginning to do good health. It was President Ford, I'm sorry. Uh, and so that bill passed and required that every state create a health plan mm -hmm. and the health plan would determine how much money they would get for their projects. Mm -hmm. So we had a terrific committee. Uh, there were 15 hospital type people, mm -hmm. hospital administrators, mm -hmm. doctors, dentists, psychologists, and then we had 16 people who were from the outside of the health uh, business, mm -hmm. uh, such as myself. Mm -hmm. I was uh, the health administrator for Problem Schools, and we had private citizens, uh, people who ran businesses. And so for the next two years, we met twice a month, and the staff of the health department did the writing, but we did the creation of what we thought was a good health plan. Mm -hmm. And Hawaii and Rhode Island, both being small states, we were the first two to complete the program wow. and the first two to get money. Mm -hmm. So after the program was written, uh, the governor, who was Joe Garrahy at mm -hmm. the time, called me in. He said, Lou, uh, your committee did a great job with getting money now. We need somebody to run a new division called Health Promotion mm -hmm. and would like you to come and work for us. So I said, well, Governor, I've got a good job now. I've got good benefits and uh, I'm enjoying it pretty much. He says, well, why don't you meet with John Tierney, who was eventually my boss, and see what the deal is because I don't know all the numbers. Mm -hmm. So I got together with John and he laid out a plan of how much they would pay me, what my benefits would mm -hmm. be. And I said, I'm making more than this money at the problem school department. Uh -huh. He says, how about if we throw in a car? Yeah. I said, mm, car sounds pretty good. Mm -hmm. As you probably know, mm -hmm. everybody does who owns a car. You have insurance and sure, all of the sure. other stuff that goes sure. with it. And we figured that that was worth about 5000 mm -hmm. And they threw in a couple of other goodies. So I became... Chief of Health Promotion at the Rhode Island Department of Health. Mm -hmm. It was a great job. We did billboards, radio, TV, all kind of promotional stuff. Mm -hmm. And we had money. Uh, when I first arrived there, I had five people on my staff, mm -hmm. including me. When I left eight years later, there were 26 wow. in my division. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of money that the government was offering mm -hmm. for health programs. Mm -hmm. So some, somebody at national, at that time, some politicians had a very good idea to create that division mm -hmm. so that states would have money to do what was good for the people. In 1972, my friend Frank Spinelli, who was the director of uh, the Children's Center on Mount Pleasant Avenue, mm -hmm. where they had children who were homeless or children who were abandoned, whatever. <clears throat> he called me up one day and said, Lou, how'd you like to come to a Rotary meeting? I said, what's Rotary? He said, well, come to the meeting and you'll see. He said, I think you'll like it. You're the kind of person who should be a Rotarian. So I said, okay. So he took me to lunch 
And uh, fortunately, that day, the speaker was Everett San Martino, whose brother and I had played football together, and I knew Everett very well. Mm -hmm. He lived on Academy Avenue, not far from where I lived. Mm -hmm. He was a judge, and mm -hmm. so he was the speaker. And three or four of the members of the club had been high school friends of mine. Mm -hmm. And so I was very comfortable that sure. day. So the next week, Frank called me up. He said, how do you like it, Lou? I said, it was good, Frank. He said, well, why don't you come again? I said, well, I'll try. I'll see if I can get out of work and come. So I asked my boss, he said, yeah, go ahead. So I went to the second meeting, and it was once again a very nice event. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he said, well, I paid for you twice now. Next time you have to pay for yourself. <laughs> I said, okay. <clears throat> so I went, and over time, I got to really enjoy it because I met nice people. Mm -hmm. We had very good speakers. So I went to the Rotary Club, and over time, uh, one day they called me up to the podium, and they said, Lou, you have perfect attendance since you joined the Rotary Club. They gave me a pin. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, that's quite a thing to do, to come to every meeting, because Rotary meets every week, and it still does. So anyway, I continued with the good attendance, and if you missed a meeting at your club, you could go to another club to make up the mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And one time I had a gallbladder operation, so I missed Rotary that week. But the next week I went to two meetings mm -hmm. and I made up. Mm -hmm. And I'm proud to say, and maybe it's crazy, I haven't missed a Rotary meeting someplace in the world in 50 years. Oh, I've been to meetings in Italy, Singapore, China, uh, India, England, a whole bunch of others. Mm -hmm. My wife and I didn't do much traveling when we were first married because like most young couples, we were struggling. Sure. And I was a school teacher not making very much money, mm -hmm. but I did part-time coach. Uh, I did coaching and part-time working and recreation because I wanted her to stay home mm -hmm. with my two daughters. Mm -hmm. And it worked out great because both of them became doctors of education mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they had in doctorate degrees. So anyway, that part worked out. <clears throat> but later in life, because of my jobs and being a Rotarian, I was able to travel. Mm -hmm. And over time, my wife and I eventually visited 32 countries. Uh, it was quite an experience. Some were for Rotary mm -hmm. and some were by design. Mm -hmm. I remember in 1970, our church, St. Mary's Church in Cranston, charted a plane and 250 of us flew to Italy mm -hmm. from our church. Wow. It was a great deal. Mm -hmm. And my daughter, Debbie, my older daughter, fell in love with Italy so much. Mm -hmm. She has now been there 14 times. Mm -hmm. Every summer she and her husband goes. He's an art person, mm -hmm. so he loves Italy because sure. of all the art sure. history. So uh, I got to like uh, Italy, and we did a little heritage searching, and my daughter became very, very much imbued with the idea of learning all she could about our family history. Mm -hmm. And just about two months ago, she became a citizen of Italy. She has joint citizenships. Uh, I became eventually district governor mm -hmm. of our district, and at the time there were 65 Rotary Clubs, 24 from Rhode Island, mm -hmm. and the 40 others from Massachusetts, southeastern Massachusetts, mm -hmm. including Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. Mm -hmm. So it was quite an experience. It was a requirement that you visit at least every club once more if you could. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes I was invited back for special mm -hmm. events or sure. whatever. But uh, that became quite an experience for me because it gave me a chance to really learn about Rotary. Mm -hmm. Before I became governor, I had to go away for a three-day weekend mm -hmm. with my wife. <clears throat> And then a seven-day training period mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. Wow. And that's what governors do, people become governors. Mm -hmm. 
one of the interesting things of Rotary Call is that every year the head person, the president of Rotary International changes. Mm -hmm. Every year. Mm -hmm. So they have a year of waiting while they're preparing. Sure. They have they live in Evanston, Illinois, where we own a, an eighteen story building. Mm -hmm. And they live there for a year getting ready. Mm -hmm. And then there's another person already in the chain mm -hmm. as the third person. Mm -hmm. So he's getting ready behind. Sure, sure. But <clears throat> picture changing your executive officer every year. Sure, that's it's amazing. It's quite a thing. Really? But Rotary has done it, and Rotary now has existed for 119 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was started by a man from Wallingford, Vermont, named Paul Harris. Mm -hmm. He and his wife got tired of living in a small community, mm -hmm. and he was an attorney, so he wanted to get business, you know, and, and mm -hmm. get involved mm -hmm. with, with uh, uh, being a, a lawyer at the upper level. So they moved to Chicago. Mm -hmm. And one day, uh, he said to his wife, you know, he said, you get to meet the neighbors and stuff. He said, I'm in that big building, and I don't, I don't know anybody in there. So he invited three people to his office. Mm -hmm. And they came and they had lunch and they talked and introduced each other and gave a little bit of life history. Mm -hmm. And that was the first Rotary meeting. Wow. That was on February 22nd, 1905. Mm -hmm. So they said, hey, this was fun. Let's meet again next week. So the next week they met and one of the guys brought another one with them. The third week they were up to nine or ten. Mm -hmm. And finally they got... After about a month or so, 16 people, I mm -hmm. said, hey, we can't meet in offices anymore. Mm -hmm. So they went to a restaurant and made arrangements to meet for lunch. And that became Rotary number one in the world. Wow. Today, Paul, there are 39,000 Rotary clubs mm -hmm. in the world. Wow. One man started it. That's amazing. Amazing. Yeah. And we do a lot of great good. Mm-hmm. Rotary is a wonderful organization. God blesses me every day. Mm -hmm. I feel really in my heart that God has kept me on this earth to keep doing stuff mm -hmm. because I have always been very, very community oriented mm -hmm. and I love to help people. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot of different things, skills and abilities and people to do good. One of the things we did that was very interesting, uh, in February, we had a program in our Rotary Club called Share the Love. Mm -hmm. and we've been doing this for a few years. <laughs> we went to the 13 elementary schools and asked the principals if we could have the children collect non-perishable -per food items mm -hmm. and then we would give them to one of the food banks in Cranston. We had already made arrangements for them to accept. So the 13 schools, over the next few days, because it ended on Valentine's Day, mm -hmm. Love Day, sure. this is nearly hard to believe. We collected over 22,000 non-perishable food items. Mm -hmm. The community service where we were depositing the food, said, stop, mm -hmm. we have no more room. Uh -huh. We filled up three or four of their big building rooms that mm -hmm. were mm -hmm. semi-empty, so we don't have any more room. <clears throat> so I, every other Saturday, I do a little charity work at one of the food banks called the Mother Mary uh, Food Bank, mm -hmm. and I called uh, David Carpentier, the director, and I said, Dave, we got a lot of food. We got to do something with it. Do you have any room? Or could you can you use it? He said, "Well, we're in pretty good shape because we've got money from the state, from the federal government, and personal donations. So we've been doing very well with food." Mm -hmm. He says, "But look, we'll take them off your hands to help you." So we brought over four thousand items wow. to his place, uh -huh. and I was there last Saturday to pick up food. I delivered to three families mm -hmm. that don't have a car, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and all of these boxes are loaded up, oh. still standing there. Fantastic! But he'll get rid of them eventually. But isn't that a great project? On May twenty-second, coming up at Garden City, we're going to have a program called Touch a Truck. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we get 25 or 6 trucks to come in, an ambulance, 
an undertaker's uh, hearse. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob Tasker sends over a couple of trucks mm -hmm. and car, a new car. <clears throat> the fire department comes in, the police department, they bring in their car. Mm -hmm. And the kids get a chance to go into the place. Mm -hmm. We charge $10 a family. Mm -hmm. Some families come with eight, ten kids. Mm -hmm. We don't check sure. about mm -hmm. it. But they come in, and the kids get a badge that they put on, mm -hmm. and they can go and get their faces painted. Mm -hmm. They get free ice cream from Newport Creamery. Mm -hmm. One of the bus companies gives them little toy buses. Mm -hmm. And they get a chance to climb up on the fire truck mm -hmm. or go into the police car mm -hmm. and, and have an experience to really touch that truck. Wow. We wow. get a big concrete truck. How many kids get a chance to see a concrete truck? Sure, sure. And uh, one of the guys... Uh, brings his uh, antique car. He's got a 1924 Ford car, mm -hmm. uh, Billy uh, <coughs> Buffoni, and he brings his car in there. And it's a great experience. Mm -hmm. Last uh, May, no, last October, mm -hmm. we had 500 people come. Wow. And it's only three hours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a great experience mm -hmm. for the kids. Sure. Touch a truck. So families, bring your kids on the 22nd from 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock to Garden City and they'll get, have a chance to touch a truck. Mm -hmm.